Welcome. Test one, two, test one, two. Welcome everyone to our in-person Ask the Mito Doc for All Ages. I'm Margaret Moore, um, the MDF Support and Education Associate. I feel certain I've met most of you already or have met, talked to you over this weekend. And we're so glad that you're here. We have a great panel of um, physicians that are here to help us with this. And I wanna start out by just thanking all of you for helping us. I also want to tell you who's up here. Um, we have Dr. Alali, we have Dr. Mugay Shalikolu, um, Dr. Russell Senado, Dr. Mary Kay Koenig, Dr. Austin Larson, Dr. Ava Marava Kozitz, and Dr. Jaya Ganesh. Thank you all for helping. We're gonna launch right in because I hope we get as many tons of questions answered today. So first question, um, and this is to the entire panel, and um, we would love to have um, as many of you answer as, would like, as you would like for this one. What are the top three things a mitochondrial disease patient can do to improve their health? Anyone can start, Dr. Exercise. McGay? Uh, exercise. Exercise is number one. Uh, good nutrition. And uh, a zen mental state. All right. Anyone else have any additional things to add? I want to add one, one important thing. That one seems to be working. You can speak like a microphone if you want. <laughs> Um, I think there is an important thing also get with those are chronic conditions you need always to get um, psychiatric or, or uh, psycho counseling in those conditions also. So at least in our center we try to get sleep studies on everybody. Sleep's really important because that's where you recover. Yeah, I try to tell my patients this isn't this isn't this is a whole body disease, right? Your whole body is being affected. And so if, I don't wanna to try to point out one thing, do this, do that, do this. It's about taking care of everything, taking care of yourself. So making sure that you use your common sense, you think about how to take care of your body. So all of these things, eat well, so get good nutrition, sleep well, make sure that you're, you're sleeping, take care of your mental state because that reduces your stress, which reduces your your ATP and energy demands. So if for you that involves therapy, which it should, because you're living with a chronic medical condition that is difficult to deal with, that's stressful for anybody. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's about looking at yourself and what it is that you need to do in order to decrease your overall energy demands. Um, and exercise, exercise exercise, even if all that means is getting up and walking to the mailbox every day or lifting your arms above your head 10 times in the morning, whatever your exercise tolerance is, exercise. I had an adult patient who took off golf, um, actually with poor strength and some uh, respiratory support. And then we would have a little uh, cart to go from a point A to point B, so that was a practical thing uh, for that individual for a little bit. And then Peloton, I mean, not Peloton, but any type of bike exercise, bike is slowly upward activity, increasing fitness gradually, as Tom rated, made the big difference in the dogs. 
So one of the things I tell my patients uh, when I newly diagnose someone with mitochondrial disease is to find out as much as you can about your disease, because amongst the number of physicians that you'll be asked to see and yourself, you and maybe one provider will be the quarterback that helps you through this uh, diagnosis and process. And that way, um, every system, uh, usually whatever dysfunction there is may have, or the mitochondrial disease may play a role in that. And you will be helping your subspecialist take care of you with the help of this one primary mitochondrial physician. Have things in writing, if you're going for surgery, if you're going for a procedure, if you're traveling, whatever you do, have things in writing that you have mitochondrial disease, these are the possible complications. These are the medications you need. And more importantly, these are the medications that they should not give you or whatever contraindication there are and have it in writing in simple English. It doesn't have to be a very scientific dissertation on mitochondrial disease, which is what you'll find sometimes, but in a very simple language, a one, two page summary of what to expect and what to look for will be very important. So I, I agree with, everything that has been said here. I'll add a couple of thoughts. So I think one of the top things that a patient can do is to make sure that they have an accurate diagnosis because there are some diagnoses that have very specific management strategies that are different from others. So that would be something. Um, I agree with uh, folks that have said uh, focusing on nutrition, but I also wanna emphasize that the right nutritional strategy can be very different for different patients. Some people need a lot of calories. They're undernourished. Other people are overnourished. Um, uh, so there, there are different strategies and, and you very well may need to work with a, a dietitian and a physician to find the right strategy for you. Um, something else that I'll mention that I haven't heard yet is um, to to make sure that you focus on the meaningful relationships in your life, to find uh, people that you can depend on and spend time with them and to find people who depend on you and to really um, take pride in your contributions to those relationships as well. We're social animals and um, as people, we really benefit from having those uh, relationships of interdependence. There's one other thing I wanted to say. That was that was great. Thank you. Um, one other thing that I've been thinking, and that's preventative care. I think a lot of people don't focus on preventative care. So as mitochondrial physicians, it's something that we think about a lot. We send you to get an echocardiogram, even though you don't have any heart symptoms. We do lab testing to make sure your kidneys are functioning and you don't have diabetes. That stuff is crucially important because it's so much easier to treat your heart before you have a heart attack. Um, than it is to treat it after you present to the ER in an unstable cardiac rhythm. So when we recommend preventative care, please do it um, because we're really trying, Faye. No, I didn't call you out. You're you're calling yourself out. I didn't call you out. Okay, because um, you know we're we're trying to prevent complications that could make things worse later down the road. Can I also say something just very quickly? I uh, agree with uh, all my esteemed colleagues. Uh, exercise therapy, I just wanted to add that you have to watch your body. Um, usually we say that it should be aerobic therapy, so we don't overuse. Uh, 20 minutes of a stationary bike is a good example, but your body probably can tolerate. Probably you cannot do it right away, just build it up. Um, if you feel pain, uh, then you should slow down. So do your exercise uh, cautiously, but very, very important to do it um, at least three times a, a week, I would say. Um, another short remark, I have an amazing patient who developed a point system. It's an adult patient who said, I have 20 points for a day. And if I do my exercise, I use up 10 points. And if I go to a party, I use up another six points. Then I sleep for four hours, a long nap, and I gained four points. And she's actually like counting these points of energy every day and trying to keep the balance that not over 
doing um, you know activities and when when it when there is too much then actually just goes to sleep so I don't know it's not for everybody but it's a, a pretty I think creative idea one of the things that I think taking care of kids and sneaking in in adults in my clinic which is kind of hard to do but I do it uh, is that one size doesn't fit all and you can't go to Dr. Google and find out what your disease is. And you can't talk to other people that you know that may have a mitochondrial disease that take such and such supplement because that may or may not work. And clearly as we learn more, we need to target what we do to that particular patient. Let me give you an example. So I, I, have a, I take care of a kid who is, has a ferritosis problem. His mitochondrial disease is due to ferritosis. So he's losing his mitochondria because of a, uh, an iron problem. So I treat him completely different than I would treat a Milan's patient. And, and so as we learn more, we start to identify particular subsets that we need to treat differently. And as Austin was talking about diets, we dietary changes are patient specific a lot of the times. And I like, if you need a ketogenic diet, I'm not gonna just say, okay, we'll start a four to one, see you in three months. You have to titrate to exact parameters that you're trying to achieve. So within this global of how to take care of a mitochondrial patient that we've, we pretty much all agree on up and down the road, you have to remember that your disease is unique and specific to you and you need to alter your care based on your disease. And that's why you need to work with everybody from, well, from Mary Kay down. Uh, I only see, no, I'm working. But you, you need to take care of yourself and you need to figure out what your needs are in all of the stuff that we're recommending that benefit most all patients. I think that's a wonderful summary of, of all of this. I want to take a brief pause to let the audience that's joining us virtually and our audience here to un understand a little bit about the flow for today. We're going to go through some of the pre-submitted questions first. And then, um, and while that's happening, our doctors are right now answering questions that have come in virtually on their computers. And after I'm done with the pre-submitted questions, we'll launch into live questions for you all. We have some microphone runners that are going to come help you if you raise your hand, bring the microphone to you. So don't worry about getting up or doing anything. They will come to you. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Next question. What about clinical trials? Does anything on the horizon look promising? I want to hear from each of you of your two cents on what's happening in the clinical trial space. So I actually got this question yesterday. And what I can say is there are so many things on the horizon that look promising. It's really exciting. Um, you know, I started this almost 20 years ago now, and there was nothing on the horizon. And now there are a lot of clinical trials. There are a lot of people that are very excited um, to be working in the mitochondrial space. And um, I actually just presented a lecture for the uh, UMDF, a virtual lecture on emerging therapies and mitochondrial disease. There are so many things that have so many different um, mechanisms of action that have the potential to work. And right now we're performing a lot of clinical trials. Um, I think it's a really exciting time for patients with mitochondrial disease. I think it is crucially important for people to participate in clinical trials. We don't know if something is gonna work or not until we try it. Um, the mice are not people, um, the zebrafish are not people. And all of these things have a really good potential to work um, and to improve mitochondrial function, but whether or not they're gonna turn into a benefit for a person, um, we don't know until we try. Um, and I know sometimes it's frightening and it's a lot of work and it's exhausting. Um, and I know for some people it's frustrating because you can't participate, um, but we're trying, we're doing it every day. Um, and we're doing this with you to try and find these answers for you. And I think we are so close. Um, I really do believe that we are close as far as picking one that I think is the most exciting. 
or the closest, I can't because I, I know the data in the mice, but the mice are not people. I need to see the data in the people. And once we see that, we're gonna know um, which one's gonna be the most exciting because it's gonna be the one that works. Uh, yeah, so there are several trials that we will uh, hear about the outcomes of the analysis in the next six to nine months. So uh, keep your ears open. Uh, definitely, we're all interested in, and excited to see how the current round of trials turn out. And to um, Dr. Koenig's point, we, we don't know until we do the study. So we, we just have to do the study. Um, I do want to put in a plug for something I was really excited about yesterday, which was um, Dr. Zulkipli Cunningham's work that she presented. Uh, so she uh, presented a series of physical therapy assessments that uh, really do seem to have much more sensitivity, much more ability to detect the symptoms that mitochondrial patients have and de to detect changes in those symptoms over time. Uh, so I'm really optimistic that her work will inform the next generation of clinical trials and help us to detect an effect when there truly is one to be found. So I think um, outcome measures are really important that we have good outcome measures to really be sure that what we are doing is um, helping. And the other thing which is really important that we don't give the same therapy to everyone. And uh, in the past, some of the clinical trials failed because we took everyone with different genetic background or different manifestations. And I think that what we learned in the past five years that we have smaller groups and very specific disease uh, groups. Um, and I think we have a much higher chance that we will find a good outcome in these groups. So uh, it's proper to have the best overall perspective of what clinical trials mean and what they're trying to answer. I've been doing clinical trials in the epilepsy field for over 21 years. And the way we would do those trials would be if you had generalized epilepsy or focal epilepsy. And we got really better drugs for focal epilepsy and then for generalized epilepsy but none of them were game changers. They all helped because we weren't asking the question, why do you have your epilepsy? And should we be treating the reason why you have epilepsy? So in mitochondrial disease, the studies now are trying to answer the question, how do you make people walk further, have more endurance? That's wonderful, we need to start there. But the real question is, why can't you walk further? Is it a particular type of gene defect or a mechanism that makes you walk less far than the next person with mitochondrial disease? The next generation of clinical trials will evolve in me calling out my patients with a pole gamma mutation and then what type of pole gamma disease do you have? And pick that subset to answer the question. Well, if I can transfer normal mitochondria into, into your eye, will I prevent ophthalmoplegia in your blindness? Well, that's a different question than will you walk further? The, the clinical trials are so important right now because we need to find out what, what's gonna be helpful generally and we need those drugs out there. But let me tell you, even drug trials that fail are extraordinarily important. And let me just take two minutes. So we were involved in a bladder study looking at rapamycin and bladder cancer. It should have worked. It made a whole lot of sense, but it didn't meet endpoints because only two patients out of the 40 responded. So it was dropped. But you know what happened? There was some tech guy at another university that found that the two people who responded had a particular mTOR mutation for their bladder cancer. So now the clinical trial changes. So there is data suggesting that if your bladder cancer is due to mTOR, rabamycin works wonderfully. 
but we wouldn't have known that data unless that trial failed. And so although it's difficult to be in a clinical trial, you lose part of your life, it's expensive. And right now we're not doing a good job of equity because if you lose a day of work, we don't reimburse you from the drug companies to come to our centers and do it. I just have to beg you, please do it. And we'll try and do a better job of compensating you for taking your time. But they're so important to do. And I'm sorry I hogged the time. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any comments at, on um, clinical trials that you, okay, we'll move on to our next question. There's one other thing, again, for those of you that are joining us virtually, the questions are being answered at a feverish pace by our uh, docs with their laptops. So thank you for that. Question number three, how do I find quality supplements and where do I buy them? This is a question I get all the time, so I'm glad it's here. What are your thoughts? My favorite cheapest at Walmart or CVS because my coverage is free. No, I agree with that. So, you know, a lot of times the supplements are the same. It's, it's what's in them and, and different supplements are made with different additives, right? So there's different extra stuff in them. It's not the extra stuff that we care about. It's the supplement itself. So I tell my patients to go online, find whatever you can find that's cheapest, go to GNC, go to Walmart, go to wherever you can find them. Costco is a great place. The problem is, is that some of them, some of the extra stuff that's in them makes you sick. So, and not sick, like hurts you, but sick, like upsets your stomach, or it makes, you know, it make, gives you reflux and causes heartburn, things like that. So I always tell people to start with the cheapest stuff you can find um, and then work from there. One of the tricks we use a lot is making protein shakes or making shakes. So, you know, you have to take all these supplements um buy big pills buy capsules buy powder form which is usually less expensive and make yourself a protein shake twice a day or a milkshake for the little kids their parent the kids love me um i say to the parents make a milkshake in the morning in the evening you know it doesn't have to be a lot just a little bit um and mix all the vitamins in that but it's not there's nothing necessarily special about the more expensive forms other than the fact that they might be more tolerable I have a very small remark, and I'm not um, any time, any way linked to the uh, whoever is um, uh, uh, selling Qnol <laughs> at Costco. But what I learned through my patients that that's the cheapest uh, coenzyme Q uh, available. So I'm advertising hereby the liquid Qnol <laughs> in Costco, which seems to have good bioavailability and. Um, I learned from my patient that that has a, a good price. Yeah, I don't have any financial relationships with any supplement companies, but a um, couple resources that my patients often use. One is called bulksupplements.com. Another one's called jomarlabs.com. Um, if you have a specific medical diagnosis, that's the indication for your use of supplements, uh, Jomar Labs will give a significant discount off the list price with the letter from your doctor. So those are a couple specific resources. And sometimes you can get uh, very friendly with a compounding pharmacy, which is what we do in Seattle. We have particular go-to pharmacies. <clears throat> and if you need a real rare supplement, like I have a, a couple of epilepsy patients on triple bromides and 
you got to make that from scratch. And so unless you know a pharmacist is going to do that. And so I've been working with this pharmacist for a long time. And I had trouble getting triseal uridine for one of my patients that had a complex one defect and it, it worked for, for her to get off her TPN and use her gut again. But I use the same pharmacist because we got triseal uh, uridine uh, from a, the company that actually makes it. And so he was able to get it for us and compound it in a formula. He put it in her TPN. And so that's, that's another way. So there's a lot of gaming in this and you have to play the system, but if it works for you and it's cheap, the cheapest is best. I agree with everybody. And the pharmacy of Costco works really well. So I think I agree with uh, Dr. Sanito. Um, I work with a lot of pediatric patients with other metabolic disease. And so we have specialty pharmacies making special formula, et cetera. So I usually use those specialty pharmacies to compound the mitochondrial uh, supplements. Uh, at least to some extent, I have a pharmacist who I can work with. But sometimes what happens is these pharmacies charge and the copay becomes a lot more than what you can get online. So you have to be very selective and do what is patient friendly. And so if I have a Mila's patient with arginine is really, I, I find, I think it's important for them to have, I will use a brand arginine. There are a few expensive brands. I'll spend le writing letters of medical necessity to get that particular brand covered. And for the rest, I will say the Walmart brand of Qnol or uh, Super B50, where you have everything to keep it at a reasonable cost, not just for the cost perspective, but also from a compliance perspective, like how much can you do uh, on a daily basis uh, for most of these parents? So I try to focus on that one supplement that is the key, like arginine and milas. All right, let's move on to the next one. I have muscle and nerve pain that is really getting in the way of my ability to function. What, what steps should I take to address this? So muscle and nerve pain is a common symptom in patients with different types of mitochondrial disease. There are medications that are specifically designed um, and available to treat particularly nerve pain. And nerve pain can be extremely debilitating. So if you're having nerve pain, so in patients with neuropathy, there's a variety of different symptoms that you can get. There's, we call positive symptoms and negative symptoms. The positive symptoms are the pain, the things you feel. The negative symptoms are the things you don't feel. So like the numbness, um, and the weakness. Unfortunately, we can't treat the negative symptoms, but we can treat the positive symptoms. So especially for the nerve pain, if you're having nerve pain, you absolutely need to be with a neurologist and you should be taking medication. Nerve pain is worse than any kind of pain that exists. It is excruciating. And there are slews of medications that treat this and they are not narcotics. Narcotics absolutely do not work for nerve pain. You have to have specific neuroactive agents to treat nerve pain. All narcotics are gonna do are gonna sedate you. Um, and they just don't work for nerve pain. They just put you to sleep and then when you wake up, the pain is still there. Um, and so if you're having nerve pain, you really, really need to be seeing a neurologist um, and sometimes when you see a pain specialist, they don't necessarily make that dis distinction. You end up on narcotics, which can cause a whole other slew of problems. Um, so again, nerve pain, uh, burning, stinging, um, electric-like pains, um, sometimes even dull or aching pains can be nerve pain. You really need to be seeing a neurologist who can treat those positive neuropathy symptoms. The numbness, the lack of sensation, that can't be treated, but typically that shouldn't be painful. It should just be irritating. Um, as far as the muscle cramping and pain, that one's a different type of pain. It's usually treated better with anti-inflammatories. Um, Again, I try to steer my patients away from narcotic medications because they cause 
in my opinion, more problems than they solve. They can cause very severe constipation. They cause more falls, which leads to fractures. Um, they can decrease quality of life by preventing you from being able to get out and go for social interactions. And let me say, I certainly do have patients who take narcotic medications for pain who need them. So by no means, if you're taking them, am I saying that that's a bad thing? Um, I'm just saying that there are lots of other things out there um, and that uh, you need to make sure you're taking the right medication for the right symptoms. So typically for nerve pain, I start with neuropathic agents and for muscle pain, I start with anti-inflammatories. Well, maybe some addition to your recommendations about muscle pain. Um, some patients have less glycogen, less stored sugar in their muscle because they have a low muscle uh, mass or they are just weak. And so when you try to exercise, um, um, you actually don't have the sugars coming to your body from your muscle store. And so um, in children who have significant uh, muscle weakness and uh, less sugar storage, we sometimes try um, cornstarch, which is a very old fashioned therapy, but it can prevent hypoglycemia. It can also prevent muscle cramping. Um, um, and then it's very disgusting because it's a white powder and it just, it's raw, so it's actually not very pleasant to swallow. But if you mix it with a little yogurt uh, before uh, trying physical therapy or exercise, you can try just uh, a small amount of that. That could be one tip for somebody who has exercise-related uh, problems or muscle cramps. Another thing is uh, avoiding high sugar-containing drinks. If you load your body with a lot of uh, sugar, your lactic acid might go up. Um, that might be part of uh, the pain you feel in your muscles. So complex carbohydrates uh, are better than very um, high sugar containing uh, drinks. And probably ridiculous, but um, a lot of physical therapy, which is related to water, helps with muscle cramps and pain. And um, th there is aqua therapy. There are massages, which could help really uh, to release your muscles. And um, I think that it seems like a luxury. And so you have to bribe your parents or your husband or <laughs> whoever is ready to do that massage for you. But I think that for, uh, for muscle cramping, actually manual therapies are working the best. So I kind of agree with everybody. And I think you need to know the reason why you're having nerve pain or muscle pain. So if you have a small fiber neuropathy, that's different from a, a, a big nerve neuropathy. And you would treat that a little bit different up front because we know some drugs for small fiber neuropathy because all the wonderful work done in the diabetes world. And long nerve neuropathy is treated differently. It's more difficult to treat. Uh, and depending why you get your muscle cramping, is it due to your particular disease? Then you need to treat your disease and it might get better. Uh, if, it's, if it's due to diet, then you need to change your diet. And I agree with the hydration. Uh, so oftentimes when the muscle cramping gets really bad for our kids, we have a special clinic called the Infusion Clinic and I can bring in the kids for four hours for hydration and then they can go home and they usually get better, but that doesn't occur with everybody. And the infusion center sees one of our patients and rolls their eyes because, uh oh, we've got another kid that we have to give 1.5 maintenance with a little bit of carnitine and we can't do anything for them, but give it to them and send them home. So, but there are some diseases like that, but if you know the reason why, if you're breaking down muscle, that's an entirely different treatment than if you're just experiencing muscle pain. So you need to know the etiology. And I think that's what we're all getting at as well. And I, I'll agree with everything that was said so far. And I'll probably give you an example. And this is probably an extreme example. This is a little teenager with uh, cardiomyopathy due to mitochondrial disease, mild intellectual disability, went into heart failure and managed to come out of the ICU. 
but for the longest time she would get um, when I had her on IV fluids, her lactates would be in the three, four range and her bicarbonates were normal. I did not even have to correct her acidosis. But then when we tried to wean off the IV fluids and uh, put her, send her home, uh, she would become acidotic and with lactic acidosis. This happened a few times and we realized that her eating patterns were not that great. So there was prolonged fasting. She was not able to eat as well as before. And we just bit the bullet, put the G tube in, and we regulated feeds and you know frequent feeding with a regular formula, but a more balanced formula. And uh, we were able to send her home, and we haven't heard from her in three months, four months. So I think that that's really the importance of you know adequate nutrition and hydration, frequent small meals, and keep up your hydration is really the key. Um, and of course, the meal balance as well more protein um, you know essential fatty acids uh, amino acids and so on are really the key i want to add one thing because you have um uh, a mitochondrial condition does not mean your neuropathy is certainly coming from these look for other reasons and um, patients with mitochondrial disorders are also can be having Cooper deficiency, for example, or vitamin E deficiency, those can cause neuropathy, and those are very easily treatable. So look for treatable condition also. And then you set your goal for, for pain management. I am in pain now, I had shoulder injury, and they set my goal for that, because I, I had patients, they tried every type of medication, did not help them. So you might not be able to eliminate the pain uh, completely. So you set your goal for that, and and try to avoid narcotic and medication as much as possible. Thank you. All right, next question. Is genetic testing improving? I was tested five years ago and they didn't find anything definitive. Should I be tested again? A lot of folks say, oh, I've had genetic testing, but what's important is what type of genetic testing you had. You know, 10, 15 years ago, there were a couple of laboratories who would look only at the common variants and say, you don't have knee loss, you don't have mito, and would end it and call it a day. Now we're doing sequencing both for mitochondrial genes that are inherited from the mother, but also for nuclear genes that are inherited from both parents. And the, the so for me, when somebody says I have mito, but my genetic testing is negative, my first question is what did you get tested on? And including in the community, neurologists, pediatricians, internal medicine folks may not do the comprehensive testing for your, oh, I don't have a mito or I do have mito results. So, uh, yeah, so it has improved a lot for sure, but we, we are, I think, hitting uh, 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 the ceiling now because we do something called whole genome sequencing nowadays, but we still have maybe, I think it's at least 50% of patients who are suspected, highly suspected to have a genetic condition, a mitochondrial condition that we can't approve because we still have limitation. Our knowledge is still limited and our technology is still limited. So... Okay. A negative result does not rule it out. Uh, it, so it, I agree with everybody. It depends what type of testing you have. So we figure out probably a new gene what every 30 days comes up in the literature. Commercial companies will not report a gene that hasn't been reported in the literature, most of them. Now, if you've had whole exome sequencing, then you can usually most companies allow you one free reanalyzation of the data to see if anything new has popped up. And it may not. And even if you, you know, if you're fortunate enough to get a whole genome sequencing, there are still abnormalities that whole genome sequencing may not pick up depending upon the company. Uh, I, I love the company that was here, but it all depends like at the University of Washington where I practice at Seattle Children's, they, they have huge egos and they don't want us to send out whole genome sequencing. So they, they want to do the whole genome sequencing, and they do a terrible job, frankly. Uh, and so it's important to know who you're getting sequenced by whom, and then when your testing was done, and then talk to your 
metabolic specialists or geneticists that you work with to find out exactly what was covered and what wasn't covered. Because new genes come up all the time. And companies are not gonna call out genes just because they look suspicious. And so every now and then, good companies will send, oh, we found a cohort of this mutation. It's extraordinarily rare, but we think it can be pathological. And then you go back to your patient and you test them further and yep, they have a metabolic compromise. So it's important to get reanalyzed to know what test you're getting and to have a really good geneticist that's anal attentive, like all of us on this panel, that would go back and look at stuff for you and tell you that we could reanalyze the stuff, let's do it, because there's a clinical trial that you may get into if we find something. So my general rule of thumb is every two years. Every two years, I relook at someone's genetics and say, where are they? So what testing have they had done? Because the, the genetics is changing so fast that we, we have to relook at it every year or two. So um, things like if you had a whole exome sequencing done before 2017, the quote, platform has changed. You know what? I'm not a geneticist. I don't know what that means. But I know that my geneticist tells me that you have to run a whole new whole exome. So you can't just reanalyze the data. You have to actually get a new sample and run the whole exome again. So um, people will say, oh, well, if you had a whole exome, then you can just reanalyze it. Not if it was done before 2017, then you have to rerun the whole thing, get a whole new sample and start over. So you actually need to be working with a doctor who knows the latest on genetic testing because it changes so fast. And my child neurology group, they don't know what they're doing. They, I mean, they're great. They know the basics, but they cannot keep up with how fast the genetic processes and testing is moving. So um, you need to be with someone like Dr. Sonetto said, who really knows the most up-to-date genetics about how testing is advancing because you guys, especially those who don't have a genetic diagnosis yet are in a field where new genes are coming out every 30 days. Hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and the likelihood that someone is going to find that answer for you in the future is real. Um, you know, I get this all the time. I get called by a lab, just like Dr. Sonetto said, and they're like, oh, you know that patient that you did testing on four years ago? We have now identified the cause of their condition, or we think we have, um, and uh, we're going to issue a new report, and, you know, you need to call your patient and let them know, and that's my happy day. I love being able to call that patient and tell them. I just, I just had a patient I've been following. She's 16. I've been following her since she was two. We just identified her genetic defect. And I'm telling you, we've been looking. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's happy for us. It's happy for you. Um, and so I just don't want anyone to give up. So stop. Y'all are making me crazy. Yes, ma'am. No. Every two years when a patient comes into my clinic, I look and make sure they have a definitive diagnosis. And if they don't, I make sure that they are up to date on their testing. So I want to add a little wrinkle here, which is that um, genetic testing is pretty sensitive these days. So the negative genetic test is not meaningless, right? If you have a negative genetic test, that doesn't mean like, oh, just wait for two years and don't think about other things. If, if you have a negative genetic test, and then, you know, particularly in the last few years, that makes it significantly less likely that there is a genetic diagnosis. It's not zero, as we've talked about. We're making important advancements, but um, it is important to consider other possibilities in that scenario where you have a negative genetic test. Real quick, not to waste every, anybody's time, but you get a negative test. So I was taking care of a little boy, uh, uh, six months old, had a terrible bony change that was really odd but he had a clinical diagnosis of something uh, that was rare, which I'm, I'm really anal attentive and I just didn't believe it because it, it didn't match up. So what happened eventually was that uh, I started working with a gentleman who's a, a geneticist, but he, it's his disease that he, he's really interested in. And so I, I, you know, I, I said, Brent, I, I think this kid may have your disease. And he goes, well, send me some fibroblasts and immortalize his lymphocytes for his parents and him and send it to me. 
So we did that in two weeks later. And he goes, Rusty's got our disease. He's got a GPX4 disease. And this isn't what the geneticist was calling. This is something else. And we can help this kid. So, and part of it is that as a parent and family members, you have to be persistent. And certainly there are Facebook pages for rare diseases and that you can match up with, which is often good to get to know about clinical trials and stuff. But, you know, it's just friendly reminders to your metabolic guy or your geneticist that, you know what, I, I was online and I heard about this one little kid that had similar symptoms to my little Sally and could it be? And then hopefully you can sort that out. But sometimes it's, it's better to be lucky than good. So thank you for my luckiness. Yeah, and I'm just going to follow up on what Dr. Larson said. Absolutely. If, if you do not have a confirmed molecular diagnosis, you should be considering every possibility because we just, we just don't know at that point. And, and so I agree wholeheartedly with what you said. Um, and, and I didn't want that to not be clear. Yeah. I just want to also add the other um, sort of side to the coin. Sometimes there is also a little bit of testing fatigue uh, that goes on. So for a genetics practice, coverage, insurance coverage, et cetera, is not there. And if you have an individual where there are no biochemical markers, the organ systems that are typically involved with mitochondria are normal. You've had normal cardiac, et cetera. And the symptom is only fatigue, but that individual can certainly have an underlying mitochondrial diagnosis. Um, that's a very frustrating situation to be in. But for the other patient population, whether you have a pediatric patient with MRI changes consistent with Lee's or with a cardiomyopathy or a growth failure, et cetera, where you really, really, really suspect that this could be mitochondrial. Uh, for those patients, uh, the exome sometimes will miss. So nowadays we're looking at genome and uh, more importantly, finding the right lab that knows what they are doing and uh, sensitive enough to pick up the nuances because new genes can be missed if you don't know what you're looking at. Um, and so that conversation should be had with your provider to make sure that everything is covered. All right, I think we are ready to bring up a, one of our, our mic runners. We realize we have one um, microphone and we're gonna take it from you two. So everybody else is gonna need to share. Um, and we're gonna open it up to the audience. Um, please indicate that you have a question by raising your hand. Give, your, give our, our mic runner a second to get, she was number one, but give our mic runner a second to get to you. Um, when you when you speak your question, I, we're going to pause for a minute. I'm going to repeat the question twice, but it's so that we can put it in the Q and A. So anyone that's um, that's maybe um, a deaf or hard of hearing will be able to read the question on the Zoom. Okay, I'll try to simplify and make sure I make it make sense. Um, my question centers around gene therapy and gene editing. I get a lot of like, even here at the conference, which everyone's been great, has been so much information, but I get conflicting opinions and different, I hear different things. And so my question really boils down to, for everybody, what, where, what is the state of the union, I guess, so to speak, in terms of gene therapy and gene editing in the, this mito space? All right, I'm gonna simplify that for our audience and say, um, where are we with gene editing and gene therapy? So uh, let, let me take a stab and then other people can answer because I've done some of the SMA studies. In fact, our group was the first group to use the gene therapy for SMA. So we did it offline. We did got an IND for it and we did it and it, it really worked well. That's pretty unique because in mitochondrial disease, it usually involves the brain as well. And our vectors in getting genes into the brain are very good. The AAV2 and the AAV9 are the, supposedly the best, but the mouse models don't work well because the mouse model brain will take those up where the human brain won't. So there are certain metabolic disorders that we're actually injecting the gene product into the particular part of the brain that the gene is deficit. And we have some pretty, really good data from Japan that in a particular metabolic disease, that works wonderfully. We can gene edit anything in Petri dish. 
we can crisper the heck out of whatever you want to crisper. So we can change that in a Petri dish. The big problem is replicating that in the human genome, in a particular, the mitochondrial genome. We're getting there. We're learning new techniques. I mean, if you heard our Carlos Moreas talk, we're getting close, but we're not quite there yet, but we're working on it. We need better vectors to get genes into the brain and into particular tissues. We need sustainability of those gene products to be completely uh, integrated into the deficit. And we don't know a lot of that data. A lot of that's really new. When I was a graduate student at UCLA, there was a guy that tried that in Israel for sickle cell. Eventually, he was booted out of medicine. But Michael Klein was as bright as they come. He just started everything too quick and thought he could bypass the system. We got to work within the system with the FDA, with our patient groups, but we, we need better tools. And the only way to get better tools is to experiment. And the only way to experiment is, unfortunately, comes out of your paycheck every week and my paycheck every week. And it costs money, but we're getting there. But in some diseases, it's just not for prime time. In mitochondrial disease, the big problem is what we have 300 different genes that cause mitochondrial disease, right? So we're going to need 300 different genetic vectors, insertions, to get to each one of your diseases. That's going to take a while. And so as UMDF is the advocate, we need to keep pushing that forward. But it just takes time. And as a genetic counselor, your hands are tied. Because the, we would think that the ability to do that is out there. And it is. But that ability translated into humans we're, we still need to learn some stuff. We need better vectors. In the uh, Duchenne's muscle dystrophy arena, where, which I'm also in, we have a gene therapy by Sarepta that was FDA approved because it was safe. Not that it worked, because in the first phase one and phase two trials, it didn't work, but the FDA approved it because it was safe. And now they wanna go back to the company and said, now you've got to tell us that it really works in muscle and makes the Duchenne's boys better. So the FDA is sort of on the side of pushing this therapy forward, but we have to be careful. And it's people like the rest of the panel down here that aren't cowboys like me that would want to be careful. So that's just my two cents about gene therapy. I love the idea. I went into medicine because of it and sickle cell and because of Tay-Sachs, but we're just not there yet. I'd love to see it before I retire. So hurry up, you guys. So maybe I completely agree. I think that it's amazing that we are able to make that construct and we know that we theoretically could uh, place that correct sequence to your cells, either through your liver, um, that it will go everywhere in your body or inject it to your brain and it will go to your brain cells. But if you think about it, this is a therapy you can only do once, and that therapy will stay in your body forever. So if it's not the right dose, or it changes something else, it changes something else in your body, which could be um, cancer cells or your heart cells, you won't be able to fight that anymore because it's there and it stays there. You cannot repeat it, you cannot take it out. So you have to find the right dose, but how would you know the real right dose, right? Because you cannot just try on healthy people like any other therapy. So I think that we are so close, but it's so scary at the same time. And, um, and I, I agree with uh, my colleague that um, we have to be a little patient just because it can be detrimental if we start it without really uh, making a good plan how we apply it. So I'm not a scientist, I'm a clinician. If you want me to ask to, to answer in years, I don't see this coming in the next five to 10 years, like it's, it's happening for, for patients. Uh, that's, I will be honest with you. Like it is, I, I, I only spent six months doing CRISPR in a lab and the steps are so slow, takes time. And then that's not to mention the FDA and the approval. And so it's, it's not happening soon. So we should not forget about other options. Um, like uh, mitochondrial uh, transfer that in cardiomyopathy patients or, or congenital heart conditions, 
or other conditions. So there are other options. We, it's okay to look for the gene therapy and, and, and hope for it, but we also, there are other options. Um, if I, I'm involved with gene therapy, not for mitochondrial, but for other diseases. And if you look at the way things have evolved in those fields is you have a firm molecular diagnosis. There is no um, question that this is Tay-Sachs disease or this is Fabry disease. It's not lumped together as a mitochondrial disease. So uh, an accurate genetic diagnosis, grouping together of similar patients uh, by age, by gender, by organ system involvement, getting a natural history study, looking at biomarkers, and simultaneously looking for gene therapy and other therapeutic advantages and to see what changes. I think that that's the best way of going through this. We are there for some diseases like PK2 where the diagnosis is definite. Um, for MILAS, for example, arginase, but for so many of the mitochondrial diseases, we don't have that yet. The numbers of these individual diseases are small, and then all the um, unknowns about gene therapy and the potential of target effects and other complications. And also, what's the longevity of the gene therapy? How long does that vector that they inject last in you and produce? But the FDA approved, I think, two last year. Um, for rare diseases, I think ALD and uh, transplant, uh, transfusion dependent hemophilia, Duchenne. So there is hope around the corner. It's coming. it's coming. We hope it's coming. But we also uh, need to focus on things like organ transplants. I mean, if you have a mitochondrial patient whose kidney is the biggest problem and is in renal failure, now kidney transplant worked. I did. We had a poster uh, in this where we did a renal transplant for these patients. Cardiac transplant has been done. Liver transplants have been done. So therapy in any form, I think, um, we will take. Um, any other questions? Okay, right here. Along with the mitochondrial disease, I have chronic migraine disease and have almost daily migraines, sometimes multiple in a day. I'm on all kinds of preventive measures, all kinds of rescue meds, but sometimes the only thing that helps me is steroids. Well, now I have pretty severe osteoporosis and I have two doctors who are in disagreement about the steroids. One says three days of prednisone, 20 milligrams, occasionally won't ruin my bones any further. And the other one says, no, methylprednisolone, you know, medrol dose pack is better. I, I don't know at this point <laughs> what to do. Yeah, so you, you're in a scenario with a pretty complicated risk-benefit calculus. Um, so, you know, certainly you have symptoms that have an effective treatment, but there's also a concerning side effect of the treatment that works for you. So, um, and you have two different opinions from different physicians about how to think about that risk-benefit calculus. So uh, that's a challenging scenario to be in. Um, could get a third opinion. Uh. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. I mean, That's it's fine. very difficult to give uh, a, an advice in this situation, I think, especially without knowing all the details. I think we both think that if we knew more, then we could maybe help you more with that answer. But I can imagine that in certain situations, if there is a good treatment for your osteoporosis and it's under treatment and you do also exercise therapy and maybe um, bone replenishment, then it's safe enough to take your medication because you're fighting that other problem, right? So if it's already on, on the actual improvement in the improvement phase, then maybe you can take the risk of taking that low dose medication once in a while um, because, you, because of your quality of life uh, decisions. Any other questions? I saw two hands over here. I just have a quick question, like curiosity with the gene editing. So if you find a way to uh, edit a gene, is that going to be different for every gene? Let's say 300 genes with mitochondrial disease. 
each gene is going to have a different approach or one way that you discover how to edit a gene and fix a disease can be used for all, all other diseases or any other gene. So just curiosity, I don't know. You go gene by gene. So it's not one one model and goes for it. Okay, I know. The, the approach can be similar. So the how you start it technically, like some technical aspects could be overlapping, but the fine tuning will be very specific for that specific gene. Okay, right. And that's why. If you're a plasmy, if you have a percent of deletion, um, they're trying to get rid of the whole that mitochondria that has the deletion and keep the normal one. So there are too many, too many, too many can, right? They're approached, yeah, they're, they're too different. Mitochondrial disorders are, are very heterogeneous from at the gene level. So for that, you can't do just one gene editing. You can, My question is with PDC um, condition, I know ketogenic diet is one of the best result outcome. However, have you had patients that, um, that have issues after being on ketogenic diet with cholesterol and liver problems in long-term? Because my son is 12, so we've been doing ketogenic diet, uh, modified Atkins for past three, four years now. And he has a great result, but we also do the other blood work to make sure that cholesterol and, and other aspects of the body, then, then I'm also focusing on making sure he doesn't get on those medicines, you know what I'm saying? I, I think the uh, best way to do it would be to work with a dietitian, a registered dietitian, um, because I've had two instances, and these are just anecdotal examples that I'll share with you. One was a non-mitochondrial patient on a very tight, strict ketogenic diet, no carbohydrate at all, and was not doing well, was in the ICU. And for uh, reasons that not necessarily important here, we gave him some dextrose because we had to give him some fluids and all of a sudden all his ICU abnormalities, the phosphate, etc., got better because the tight ketogenic diet was what was causing some of the problem. And the other example I'll quote is a girl with proven mitochondrial disease had intractable seizures and they wanted to try. And if you think about a conventional ketogenic diet, they generally fast the patient uh, for a few hours. And even as she fasted, the ketosis was very, very high. So the level of ketosis was significant. And as soon as the diet was started, she had some cardiac issues, which completely reversed after we took her off the ketogenic diet and then managed her with traditional anti-epilepsy medications. So again, with mitochondrial disease, that's the problem actually with this. It is not one diagnosis. It's like, it's an umbrella term. It's like saying, I have, a, I have cancer. It could be breast cancer, many other cancer. So this is not one size fits all approach. Every patient is different. And that is why very small steps and what is done for the general population of sick patients is not applicable for mitochondrial. You have to do very, very small steps and with the ability to back off if something is not working um, and then try something again. And I think that that's the way to go about it. Yeah, so um, there are some patients who do have a, a pretty striking clinical benefit with ketogenic diet that have pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. Um, I think what we know about the ketogenic diet in general is that about a third of patients will have significant dyslipidemia or elevated LDL with uh, the, the extremely high fat diet that's required to maintain ketosis. About two thirds of people don't have significant lipid perturbations on a keto, keto diet. And uh, so we have relatively long term data from a condition called GLUT1 transporter deficiency, which is not a mitochondrial disease, but uh, there are folks that's a disorder of uh, inability to get glucose from the bloodstream to the brain. So a ketogenic diet is also a treatment for that condition. 
And um, there are people who have been on the diet for uh, a decade or more. Um, and I think for the most part, my understanding is that you can tell pretty quickly if people are in that category that, that do have significant dyslipidemia versus not. And if they're not, then people seem to tolerate it pretty well for indefinite periods of time. You know what, what ratio you're shied on? What ratio? The ratio. Well, what's the, the ratio of fat to others? You see? Mm, yeah. Got it. So uh, I started them. I had a couple of patients with pyruvate, and they did they did well. We I started them very slow, extremely slow. To some people do not like that, but it's really slow. And and some of them they show really great, great um, improvement. It's not that they are running around, but they interact better. They are less irritable. I think it's important to look also on just not to beat them in a high ratio for fat to, to other. They still need some carb. Um, hi, how are you? I'm sure this is a very vague question, but my daughter was diagnosed with KSS and from being at my first conference and speaking to different families and members who have KSS and seeing the difference in symptoms. Um, how, like, how do you know like what's next? I guess there's no way, I guess exactly tell them, but I just see such a difference in symptoms in different people with the same diagnosis and just to know like what we're up against. Um, I think that it's very important to know whether the size of the deletion is large or smaller or multiple deletions and whether the percentage of this, the cells, uh, so the heteroplasmy, so whether the mutation is in all the cells equally or maybe uh, just partially present. Mm -hmm. um, patients with lower heteroplasmy, so just a mosaic form of the disease tend to do better and maybe not all the organs get involved in the disease. I have a 60 year old patient who showed symptoms only in, after you know young adulthood and still doing very well. I'm still screening my patient for all the potential abnormalities which are um, a common in current science syndrome and I screen uh, him twice a year. Um, even when, when you say screening, is that more genetic testing or when you say screening, is it additional testing than genetic yes. testing? So no, not gen and I no. do the genetic testing found his deletion size and the percentage in okay. the, in the different cells. Mm -hmm. And after that, I had the diagnosis. I, I keep on checking his heart. I check his uh, kidneys. I check his eyes. I go through all the systems, even though he's relatively mild. Right. Um, and I keep on doing that diabetes screening I'm doing. And uh, I think that in current sire syndrome, the patients are very variable, but the two very dangerous complications, um, uh, the diabetes and the heart rhythm yes. abnormalities are always on my mind. And some patients, even with a small heart abnormality would go for pacemaker placement. And I actually am very positive about that. There is some discussion with the cardiology community about preventive pacemaker placement, but it can save the life of a child because that can, ha or an adult, because that can happen anytime. I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, you did. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. I want, I, want, I want to say your child is not other child any other child, children with KSS, every child is different. Even with the deletion itself, because the deletion does not define your other genetic neighborhood that can be positively or negatively affecting that. And as uh, has been said, it's what we call it surveillance. There are published surveillance for patients with KSS, which is just to follow them and, and, and do those trying to be proactive, diagnose, did it predict, uh, find them before they are symptomatic and then treat them as, uh, as early as possible. 
I tell families when I first meet them that what's written in the literature for survival and outcome and complications are general guidelines, that we really need to be aware of them, but that at baseline, for me to get more information about the child, I need time, uh, six months, a year. Uh, how many times has the child been in the hospital? How, what complications has there been? What were new symptoms developing? If things are going very rapidly, the discussion is different than someone who's holding stable. And uh, it's, that's what I meant when I said a Zen state, because families want something very immediate and want answers immediate from their doctors. But no two KSS patient I've seen is the same as the other. No Milas is the same as the other. I'm always surprised when I look at numbers and the patient and where things are. So you do the basics and hope for the best is the approach here. We have time for one more question. We have to wrap up because they need the Zoom for another meeting. All right, thank you. And this is, I think you probably already answered this, but for reassurance, my daughter is 16 year old, uh, 16 year old, 13, probably 13 years old when diagnosed with KSS. Uh, since that time, she's insulin, became insulin in, uh, dependent. Uh, we had, she has a, I probably got this wrong. She has some kind of heart block. So they all suggest we got a, a pacemaker in uh, for preventive, hasn't even had to kick in yet at all. So my scariest words to me are progressive. That's what bothers me the most. So what I'm hearing, every KSS patient is different. So am I right to think we got the, the progressive side of this and everyone's different, so we can't predict. She could stabilize the way she is now, or there could be, so you got progressive going this way and you got treatment and clinical trials going this way and hoping the clinical trials and treatments are ahead of the progressiveness. So I guess I don't have a question there, but everyone's different. So I, I can hope for the best, do the clinical trials and the progressive part can be different timing for every KSS patient. Yes. I guess that's my question. Different timing for every kid. And sometimes what's important is with the progressiveness, uh, we physicians in the old papers have not really identified what led to the, that change. Was it a viral illness, which is what Dr. Peter McGuire is studying? Was it the flu? Was it a hypoglycemic episode that stressed the child? So those things are important in having a metabolic balance all across uh, the system. You know, the best nutrition, the uh, making sure that they're well hydrated, making sure that they're active, and then, you know, hopefully you will prevent further progression. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I was I was biking last Monday, and in the same trail that I always biked, and they did a mistake, and they fell down my shoulder, and I injured that. So what I mean to say, you don't know what's will happen in the future. Just focus on her care now, and do the surveillance and nothing more than that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was I was just gonna commend you on your mindset. It sounds like you are kind of maintaining both being hopeful, but also prepared. So I, I think maintaining those two things simultaneously is important to, um, to know what the possibilities are, to know that uh, certain things are a risk, like diabetes, like heart block, hearing loss, visual impairment, um, assess for those things, intervene when you can, but also be hopeful, as you said, that uh, therapeutic developments are going to outpace the progression of the disease. Well, thank you all for joining us and a, a very gigantic, gigantic and special thank you to the physicians that joined us today for this, this time. Um, we hope to, well, we do this every month, so we hope to see you at the, we're not going to be doing it through the summer, so we will start back in the fall with our regularly scheduled virtual SMIO docs, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference again. Thank you.